Man, this church is growing so fast. There's so many of y'all I haven't met, which is amazing. And so I thought I would just take a moment to reintroduce myself. My name is Doug, by the way. I would love to meet you. And this is my family. This is the Weckenman crew. That is my beautiful wife, Samantha, of 10 years. People tell me all the time I married way out of my league, and praise God for that. But like, also, I got feelings, you know? It's like, oh my gosh, your wife's so much better looking than you. Thank you, I think. That's our five-year-old Will. He is the same age as this church. Let that blow your mind. And then our three-year-old Kinsley, and she is savage in all the best ways. I cannot tell you how much I love that little girl, man. And then we got a third baby on the way. That'll be here. Thank you. I did so much, so thank you. That'll be here at the end of June and um, this might shock you, but this is just a strategy that we have. Um, we have waited uh, until delivery day to figure out the gender and be surprised for both kids so far, and that's also our plan for baby number three. I know you don't hear that happening too much anymore. It's my, my, it's my wife's idea. It's my wife's decision. I just roll with it because I want to be happy. Um, but it actually is a good strategy, and here's why. A couple of reasons. Number one, it makes delivery day that much more awesome. But number two, strategically speaking, everybody wants to buy you baby clothes because who doesn't love baby clothes? If you don't love baby clothes, you can just see yourself out right now. I mean, baby clothes, what's not to love? You go to a store and you're looking at like a onesie for a newborn and your thought is, so you're telling me a human fits in this? That's adorable, I'm buying it. But they can't if they don't know the gender. So instead, they buy you all the practical things you actually need, like a crib, like a high chair, and a diaper genie, and four billion diapers. And then when the baby gets here, and it's a boy or it's a girl, everybody's so excited, they buy you the clothes anyways. <laughs> it works without fail 100% of the time, I'm telling you. Some of you are taking notes on that, and that's just good sense right there. I've got good strategies, I've got bad strategies, I've lived them. It is a bad strategy to break up with your girlfriend on Valentine's Day. I did that. By the grace of God, we're now married. It's another story for another day. I've hated Valentine's Day ever since, all right? It's a bad strategy to forget that it's your two-year dating anniversary and show up to your girlfriend's house wearing sweatpants and a tank top with messy hair just thinking you're gonna watch a movie and chill only to have her answer the door all dolled up and dressed up expecting a romantic evening. Hard to, hard to talk your way out of that one, all right? I'm pretty good at talking my way out of stuff. That one's challenging. I got bad strategies, good strategies. Here is the bad strategy we're talking about today. Expecting pornography and anything sex outside of God's design to fulfill you and give you what it promises. Proverbs 14, 12 says this. There is a way that appears to be right, but in the end leads to death. Like, did you, did you get that? There are ways that appear to be right to us, but in the end lead to death. When it comes to love, sex, intimacy, and identity, there is so much confusion in our culture right now. And sometimes confusion can feel like I'm in a washing machine, disoriented. What's up, what's down, what's right, what's wrong? I don't know. Sometimes confusion feels like that. But sometimes confusion looks like this, being so sure that you're right about something that you have no idea how wrong you are. There is a way that seems right on the surface. The world has patterns for love, sex, and intimacy that sound so good on the surface, they promise life, but the statistics are telling a completely different story. The stats are telling stories of, of loneliness epidemics and, and broken families and, and confusion and, and insecurities and pain and, and broken hearts. Man, ever since the sexual revolution in the 60s, when we were essentially promised liberation and consequence-free sex, all that's happened since is the divorce rate has skyrocketed, men are more broken, women are more objectified, everybody by and large is less fulfilled, and children pay the highest price of all of us. That's why when the, when the world, when culture makes statements about God's quote unquote archaic and outdated prude vision for sex, I'm like, man, with all due respect, are we looking at the same reality? 
Ephesians 5, 10 through 11. Carefully determine what pleases the Lord. Take no part in the worthless deeds of evil and darkness, but don't just not take part in it. Instead, expose them. Bring them to the light. That's why the devil hates this conversation because ever since Genesis 1, God has given us good strategies that lead to life. And ever since Genesis chapter 3, the devil has given us bad ones that appear to be right and appear to lead to life, but in the end, all they do is steal love and destroy homes. Guys, relationships were God's idea. Sex was God's idea. Hello. Like, he made it to feel good. God thought of that. God designed sex to be passionate and intimate and powerful, so powerful that he gives us parameters and a context to steward the gift of sex in, in a covenant marriage. Because It's called being a good dad, not because he's trying to take from you. God's got nothing to gain from anything you could give him, anything he could take from you. He is only trying to give. Contrary to popular belief, he is not the cosmic killjoy party pooper in the sky trying to shut down your party early. That's just not God. Like, wake up, man. The devil's tricking you. The, de the devil is distorting the truth in good-sounding ways to make it seem like the world's living it up and everybody's finding what they're looking for when it comes to sex. And the word Christian is synonymous with the word boring. The devil's just a good liar. He's lying. Take an honest observation of the world. The world has sexual patterns and they are working right now for nobody. Nobody. We live in a sex-saturated world full of wildly unhappy people. Kind of like dying of dehydration in the middle of a saltwater ocean. Water everywhere, but not a drop to drink. And on the surface, it looks refreshing, but the salt makes you thirstier and thirstier with every sip. My prayer has been we would shine a light on the darkness of sexual immorality and by grace and truth together. Truth without grace is just mean. Grace without, grace without truth is meaningless. But grace and truth together that we would leave here with a better strategy and sobered up without a hangover. Because God wants you to win at love. He wants you to win at sex and intimacy. And he has tried and true strategies in scripture to help you do just that. So I'm speaking today from three authorities. The authority of scripture, the authority of science, and the authority of my own experience. I'm not preaching at you. I have not a judgmental bone in my body when it comes to you being stuck in this stuff because I know how it feels to be stuck in sexual sin. And more important, I know how it feels to be freed by the grace of God and experience his, nurse, his mercies making me new every single morning and finding out the more that he has in store for me. I know that's called authority. That's called the authority of the power of the testimony. I know what the blood of the lamb can do in your life and how it can set you free. And so let me just offer you some hope and some grace before we go any further in this. Romans chapter eight, verse one. There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. That's worth memorizing and it won't be on the screen because I want you to hear it again. There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So you don't get to condemn you. The devil don't get to condemn you. Why? Because God doesn't even condemn you. So you might be under the impression that you've struggled too much or you've struggled for too long or you've done or seen too many dark things that you've somehow ruined God's plans and purposes for your life. But can I just reassure you, friend, you're not that powerful and you need to receive grace because you're just not that good at sinning. You're not loved. None of us are loved because we earned it. You're loved because Jesus paid for your sin by being murdered on a cross and your salvation and forgiveness is yours, signed, sealed, delivered by the blood of Jesus, legally speaking, in heaven. None of us are loved by God because we earned it. That's not how this works. You're not a son or daughter by your worth. You're a son or a daughter by your birth. And God's not more in love with some future version of you that's got more of your stuff together and is no longer stuck or struggling. He is in love with the broken person that sits in this chair today. He loves you exactly the way you are and way too much to leave you there. So if you're a work in progress, you're in the right place. And that is the grace that invites you to be free, amen? amen. Now, let's talk the truth that actually sets you free. 
I want to show you something called the lust cycle. The first thing that happens in the lust cycle is you see something, right? It's just a glance. It's, it's just a video. It's just, it's just one night. It's just one hookup. It's just, it's just scrolling through fitness pictures on Instagram, right? It's just one, one TV show that everybody watches, and I watch because it's a good story, but that it also is full of those scenes that I know they entice me. It's just, it's just novels nowadays, a lot of that, that are just full of sexual scenes, and you know that it entices you. It's just, a, it's just a glance, and then you get hit with the love drugs in your brain, dopamine, oxytocin, and serotonin, and it's immediately followed by the crash of guilt and shame shame and you 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 want to be done with it forever and you tell yourself this isn't who I am this isn't who I want to be and maybe you even swear your swear to yourself I'll never do it again but then here comes the pestering and it nags you and maybe you get triggered in a moment of exhaustion or in a moment of anger or in a moment of hunger and then you tell yourself this lie one more time it's always a lie because by definition, whatever you feed grows. Whatever you feed, that urge gets stronger. So it'll never just be one more time because then the cycle starts over again, more and more reinforcing the neural pathways in your brain again and again until eventually you try to shake yourself free and you realize you're more stuck than you thought. I've heard it said, sin will take you farther than you wanted to go, cause you to stay longer than you wanted to stay, and make you pay more than you wanted to pay. Your brain, it uh, is amazing. It consists of 50 billion neurons, four miles of blood vessels. It transmits more messages a minute than all the phone calls in the world will today. Your brain is a miracle designed by God to be neuroplastic, which means it's always changing. You can think of your brain kind of like an ongoing game of Tetris, transforming in the direction of whatever it takes in via your five senses. Those are like the new pieces that you get in this game of Tetris that your brain is. And so the, the books you read and the TV shows you watch and the, the things you give your time and, and the thoughts you give your attention to and the music that you listen to and the posts you scroll past and the people you surround yourself with, all of these things are influencers that drip by drip disciple you. The question isn't are you being discipled, it's what's discipling you. Because neuroplasticity begins to combine with lust and pornography to start to downgrade your brain into something less than God's best for you. And before you know it, now you start to feel just withdrawals all the time. And your brain is in a constant state of being hypersexualized. It's like, man, every gust of wind, every breeze, like, oh my gosh, I just, I need this right now. I see this everywhere I go. It's all I think about it. And before you know it, you start to be less happy than you used to be. And before you know it, your self-esteem goes down because your self-esteem essentially it's just your reputation with yourself and as your reputation with yourself goes down because you're like this isn't me I can't believe I'm then your their insecurities start to rise and restlessness and anxiety and more and more loneliness because you start to feel isolated because you feel like I'm the only one and there's shame attached to it so nobody else can find out about this and you start to feel less attractive than you used to feel and things that used to interest you no longer really interest you people you used to love spending time with it's no longer quite the same and and, and reality starts to become boring and so you go back to the source because pornography really is a great escape from the pain it's very effective I'm gonna say something crazy I don't think pornography is your problem I think it's your medication that you're using to numb the real problem a trauma or a memory or the just the broken human heart all of us are fallen and in this together we just all have different drugs of choice and God wants to heal that thing, but he can't heal it unless you're willing to feel it. But the inner journey is just so terrifying for us that we'll do anything to distract ourselves from it and not feel it and numb it. So just a little bit more pornography. It's just one more hookup. At first it was just a little flirting and now it's, a, it's an emotional affair, dumping dopamine into your brain in such potent amounts and then immediately depleting the dopamine and dropping you below baseline into a state of guilt and shame. And here's what's crazy. The dopamine system was designed by God way more more for pursuit of the reward than it is for the actual reward itself. It's designed to get you going. It's designed to get you motivated to go after rewards. Pornography hijacks it because pornography is just a reward, zero pursuit or effort required. 
and it starts just to, to hijack that system. Like, it, may, it spoils your brain. So men, lean in for a second. Your dopamine system was designed by God and given to you to motivate you and arouse you, so to speak, to notice a woman and, and pursue her and ask her out and plan the date and buy the flowers and commit to her and practice communication and get better at intimacy and sacrifice and commit long term. And as you do that, your brain drips a healthy amount of dopamine to give you a sense of purpose and meaning in the process. And then it helps you steward and fully enjoy the reward of sex in its proper place. But when all you have to do is click a video and you see 4K footage of other people having sex, and your brain dumps oxytocin that causes you to bond with whatever's in front of you, even if it's a computer screen. Ladies, when all you have to do is send one DM, and with no sacrifice and no effort, you can have sex with somebody new tonight, zero strings attached. I'll, I'll, I'll quote neuroscientist Andrew Huberman. Getting the love drug reward without the effort or sacrifice is one of the worst things imaginable for the human brain. It's the same concept as synthetic drugs. Pop and Percocet feeling amazing. All the reward, zero effort to create it. Dr. Satinover of Princeton says, it is as though we have devised a form of heroin a hundred times more potent, usable in the privacy of one's own home and injected directly into the brain through the eyes. The internet is now the world's biggest drug dealer and we are living in the middle of, the, of a gigantic experiment. What happens when you give billions of people unlimited access to anything and everything, sex and pornography? And the answer is, it is destroying us. 56% of divorces partially caused by pornography. Pornography increasing infidelity by 300%. Increasing stats about porn causing erectile dysfunction in men by the age of 26. One in three pornography users are female, so this isn't a guy thing, this is an us thing. It's an us thing. By and large, they say men are more drawn to visual pornography and women to literary pornography. Uh, I heard, a, oh man, I heard this quote this week. Men fall in love with what they see, women fall in love with what they hear. And that's why women will always wear makeup and men will always lie. I love you guys, have a great day. That was my humor break because that just, man. All right, that's the world, the world strategies are producing. This is what it's producing. So not to be graphic, just realistic. This is shooting bullets into your brain. Historically speaking, sexual immorality has taken down nations, and we will not be the exception. It kind of, it's like a Trojan horse that breaches and enters as disguised as sensuality, making big promises. Who wouldn't want this? And then once it's in, out comes division and rage and confusion and loneliness. I mean, forget church for a second, guys. Let's just talk our, our secular cultural moment. Historically speaking, if a man wanted to have sex with a woman, he had to like be a good man and well-respected by the community. He had to be competent and have his life together and have a vision for his life in order to invite somebody into that vision and not be addicted to video games and learn to be somewhat charming and be willing to sacrifice and be willing to commit. And now he just needs an iPhone. So the reward of sex, one of the primary motivations for maturing and making something of his life, he can now get as a super stimulus in infinite amounts whenever and however he wants with no work and no sacrifice required. It's no wonder experts are calling this a Peter Pan generation of, of men and women just delaying growing up by all means possible. If I could just talk to the unmarried ladies in our church if he is leading you to believe that you are only worth it, if you have sex with him, look right at me. He ain't worth it. And your temporary loneliness now 
is infinitely better than your permanent loneliness stuck in a marriage with a boy who lost all interest in pursuing you the moment you said I do to him. You are worth so much more than that. I don't think you understand quite how valuable you are. That scripture calls you the favor of the Lord and likens you to buried treasure waiting to be discovered. If you read the beginning of Genesis, it's almost like God creates Adam and then goes, eh, I can do better, <laughs> and makes Eve. Like the pinnacle of his creation. You are so valuable, and the more you start to realize how much you're worth, the less you'll, stop, you'll start giving people discounts on it. Let's go. I was gonna be done, but I got, I got more. This will be traditional, but I think we could all use a dose of traditional. If it was somehow possible to like send a frequency to all the unmarried women in our country at the same time, and somehow like all y'all got together and collectively decided no more sex until he's willing to date me, pursue me, commit to me, and marry me, I promise you, you give it two years, three years tops, this country will be overflowing with the most amazing and godly men in the history of the world. I promise you. I promise you, you set the bar in so many ways. Right now, the bar's about here. I'm, I'm just telling you, men will rise to the occasion, but not until they need to. And man, this is just, it's tough because for so many of us, and this is an us thing, like this started in innocence, you know, and didn't ask for it, and a trauma or a moment or a movie scene, and before you even knew it was a drug, it, it had you, and listen to me. God is righteously angry, but not at you, at an enemy who has so effectively taken a beautiful gift and turned it into a weapon to steal and kill and destroy the lives of his kids. So if you hear nothing else today, you hear this. God is crazy about you. You are not alone. You've not gone too far. You're not a bad person. You're just stuck, so let's get you unstuck because God's got better for you. Listen to me, he still does. I don't care what your story is. I don't have to know it to know the authority of scripture that God still has better for you. And if you want it, the best can still be yet to come. Romans 12 verse two says this, don't conform to the patterns of this world, translation, the bad strategies of this world, but rather be transformed, what, how? By the renewing of your mind. In other words, neuroplasticity works in the other direction as well then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will for your love life, God's vision for your, your future sex life. Because porn has combined with neuroplasticity to rewire your brain to lust and downgrade it to something less than God's best for you. But now, neuroplasticity can combine with the gospel and rewire your brain to love again and to enjoy again and to feel passion and zeal for life again, for that color to come back again, to realize God has more for me and he always will once again. Like that can come back. You just have to, to change the influence in what your brain is taking in. So here's, 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 a better, here's a better cycle than the lust cycle. I'll call this the love cycle. Let's go through this one. This is your plan for fighting for freedom. Number one, you need to live in the light because God can't bless who you pretend to be. And then number two, you need to get a better vision because you, you need a good reason to fight for freedom because it is a fight. 
And then you need to live unreasonably because only the unreasonable men and women will truly walk in freedom when it comes to this stuff in our cultural moment. And then you need to lean into God's love and simply offer, you offer your body as a living sacrifice. God, even when I don't fully understand your ways, you still have my obedience. You know how honoring that is to him when you give God your obedience even when you don't understand? I lean into his love and let his love begin to transform you from the inside out and you keep going and you keep fighting because what was once impossible for you on your own suddenly no longer is with God in the picture. The love cycle, so let's go through it. Number one, you live in the light. Live in the light. The whole point of today, that's why this is like a heavy topic, but you feel a lightness and freedom in the room because we're dragging something from the darkness into the light. Live in the light. Ephesians 5, 8 says this, for you were once darkness, but now you are light in the world. So live as children of light because darkness is Satan's playground. Therefore, confession equals freedom. In scripture, there's two versions of confession. We confess our sins to God, one time for salvation and forgiveness, and then we confess sins to each other so we can pray for each other for your healing and wholeness as many times as needed for you to walk in freedom. Confession is for you. It might be a word that has a religious bitter taste in your mouth. That means it, that means it needs to be redeemed in your life because the end game of confession isn't confession. It's healing for you, wholeness for you. Proverbs 28, 13, whoever conceals their sins does not prosper, but the one who confesses and renounces them finds mercy, never ending layer after layer of God's mercy. So your prosperity is directly correlated to your confession. That's why we take groups so serious at Red Rocks. So if you're looking to cultivate committed Christian community, I mean, today's your day, like sign up for a group. This is part of living on purpose, creating community where we don't just, uh, wait, like having buddies is easy, but having Christian community that spur you on and don't let you settle or compromise in what's, what, what God has for you that's best, I mean, that takes living on purpose. That takes cultivating it because you can have secrets or freedom. You just can't have both at the same time. And so some pastoral advice from my heart to you, even if you like, can't get in a group today, is this, find a friend or a mentor that you trust with your confession and introduce confession into the, into the relationship saturated in the grace of God. Me, Ryan, and Ethan, every Monday morning, we meet to talk about the church and and logistical stuff, but before we, we do any of that, we check in and each answer two questions. What did I do this week to feed my spirit and what did I do this week to feed my flesh? And it is so healing, it's so freeing. That's part of like the cadence of my week, one of the best gifts God's given me, but it also was us creating it and cultivating it. Because if you're gonna break the lust cycle and rewire your brain to love, the first thing that has to go is shame. Man, shame, it has to go. It has to go. It is lying to you, you guys. You need to outsmart it. It is lying to you. Your sin does not keep God from you. Jesus made sure of that on the cross. But your shame will keep you from him because it's, it's outsmarting you and you're falling for the lie. So outsmart it. God is not ashamed of you. He does not regret what he purchased on the cross when he looks at you. God loves you, you are not alone, and you find that out firsthand when you stop hiding and start living in the light. You figure out that shame develops in the darkness, but it shrivels up in the sunlight. Live in the light. And then, get a better vision. The number one reason they say people get stuck in porn addiction is meaninglessness. And that's just like, that breaks my heart so much because I, I know maybe what you don't know, which is how much meaning and purpose you really do have in God's eyes this side of heaven. You have more meaning than you, you know what to do with. But I, I guess it is true what, what scripture says that if you don't have vision, you start to perish. If you don't have a better vision, you say yes to anything and everything. You need to get a better vision because you need a reason to go through withdrawals. 
and you need a reason, something better to fight for because purity ain't for the faint of heart, but I'm telling you with just a little bit of vision and a little bit of purpose that you're up for it because you're made in the image of God. There's royal blood coursing through your veins. You got more grit in you than you know, and there's something about you that's just actually not created for the road most traveled, and you are up for this. You are. Because here's what we know, if, if you're addicted to pornography on any level, physiologically speaking, because I'm not trying to sell you nothing today, you've got a challenging 90-day journey in front of you with relentless battles and withdrawals and ups and downs over and over and over. And you're gonna need to over and over and over again choose what you want most more than what you want now. It's just in order to choose what you want most, you need to know what you want most. You need to have some vision. You need to get a better vision because with no vision, then you might, yeah, it is meaningless and just do whatever. But if you have vision, then you make decisions today in light of that vision. So I do premarital counseling all the time. One thing I'll ask couples who are about to get married and it always throws them off and I love it, but I ask them, what is your vision for your marriage? Not your wedding. Your marriage. And it, I love it. It throws people off. It gets them thinking because the answer I get a lot is, man, we just like, we want like a healthy marriage and stuff. And I'm like, oh, no way. <laughs> and then with love and grace, I'll say, that vision sucks. <laughs> I felt nothing when you said that to me. Like, what's your vision? Five years from now, 10 years from now, five decades from now, who are you? Who are you becoming together? Like, where are you? What do you want as far as parenting goes? What do you want romantically and financially and career-wise? What kind of legacy do you want to leave? What do you want sexually? I'm talking about like in your golden years, still like being more in love with each other than you are now and enjoying each other more. They're like, give me, you need a why that makes you cry. Like, paint a picture for me, man. Because if you get a better vision of what you want most, then all of a sudden a sermon like this goes from being a message about not sinning to a message about not settling. This is about not settling in case you thought otherwise. God has better for you. He has better for you. You need a better vision your life is not meaningless in Jesus' name. The best can still be yet to come in Jesus' name, but you need a better vision than the BS, bad strategy vision the world is trying to sell you every day in regards to love, sex, and intimacy. There is a way that seems so good that it leads to life. If you could learn from the stats, like some things are just, we don't all have to learn everything the hard way. I wanna see my kids' generation, I wanna see our generation like give testimonies about not I learned things the hard way, although that's a beautiful testimony. But man, I just, I guess I just tried to do this God's way. And so much like thriving in my marriage and my love life and, and intimacy. You need to get a better vision. And the next thing is this, you need to be unreasonable because only the unreasonable, only the unreasonable men and women will truly walk in freedom when it comes to sexual morality, immorality in 2024. Only the unreasonable. What do I mean by unreasonable? 1 Corinthians 6.18 says this, flee. Somebody say flee. Okay, flee from sexual immorality. That's the Greek word pornea, where we literally get pornography. So flee from pornography. All other sins a person commits are outside the body, but whoever sins sexually sins against their own body. Now, the first time I read that verse, I read the word flee, and I went, that's a little dramatic. Flee? That's unreasonable, maybe. Here's what I'll say to you. Don't call wisdom legalism to your own peril. You don't flirt with sexual sin. According to this, you don't even fight it. You flee 
from it because scripture describes the enemy like a prowling lion looking for somebody to devour. A lion, by definition, is one of five apex predators on this planet. And one characteristic of an apex predator, they don't hunt the herd, they hunt the isolated. The enemy is like a lion looking for someone to devour. A few years ago, I was on a safari in Kenya. It was so cool. When you're on the savanna and you have to pee, you pee wherever the animals pee, wherever you can find. And so I had to pee, so I jumped out of the safari truck and I found some shrubs and conducted my business on this side of the shrubs. And then I hop back in the truck and we drive around to the other side of the shrubs. And all of a sudden my wife screams because this was right on the other side. I'm not kidding, this is not a joke. I literally peed right on the other side of those bushes. And I t- I'm telling you, in that moment, I-, I was not thinking, oh my gosh, it's so cute and fluffy. I love Simba. <laughs> I felt respect and a healthy fear. This thing can take me down. Sexual sin is a lion. Porn is a lion. You do not keep it as a pet, thinking you've got it under control, thinking you've got it tamed. You don't. You don't flirt with it. You're not the exception when it comes to this stuff. You are the rule. Eventually, a lion will do what a lion does every single time. If you remember the story of Joseph and Potiphar's wife at the end of Genesis, it's crazy because Potiphar's wife truly is like the original desperate housewife because Joseph is working at Potiphar's house and Potiphar leaves and then Potiphar's wife hits on Joseph. Joseph, and Joseph flees out of the house and halfway across Egypt. And you think, again, like, dramatic. In college, one of our best friends, we'll call him Joey, like Joseph, he was addicted to pornography and wanted freedom so bad. And he decided to put Covenant Eyes, one of those apps that replaces your Safari or Chrome on all of your devices, all of them. And it's a new browser and it keeps you from seeing things you shouldn't, keeps you from going to websites you shouldn't go to. I've had it on all my devices in seasons where I've really needed it. You can't even go to like DickSportingGoods.com. Like that's how effective they are. It eliminates the temptation altogether. It's kind of like when I'm on my, ho- my, my, my way home from work and I stop and pick up Chick-fil-A for the family, I will literally, I'm not kidding, I put the bag of Chick-fil-A in the trunk of my car. Because if it is in my front seat, back seat, if it's anywhere in the car and I start smelling those fries, I, I, I don't know what, like something comes, I'm like, I like dissociate from myself and start just eating all the fries and I show up empty handed, no food for my family. It's a terrible strategy. The Chick-fil-A literally goes in the trunk of my car because why resist a temptation in the future when you have the power to eliminate it today? That's what apps like Covenant, Covenant Eyes do. And Joey put that on all of his devices. And not only does it eliminate the temptation, but you can also put in emails for accountability partners, not so they can shame you. It sends them updates, not so they can shame you. Quite the opposite, actually. So they can make sure you don't get stuck in shame. And if you fall, they make sure you fall forward and they pick you up and they remind you who you are and whose you are and that God still has a plan for you and you're doing better than you think. This is the beauty of accountability. So whatever emails you want to put in there and Joey, he just put one one email address in, his mom's, his mom's. And you might hear that and go, that is so stupid. That's crazy. Unreasonable, maybe. Maybe. I agree. Can I tell you today, he is four years into a thriving marriage with a beautiful wife that he enjoys. He is one of the godliest, freest men that I know. And he's now the father to a beautiful one-year-old little girl. Only the unreasonable. Here's a link. Um, to a battle plan for your fight for freedom against all this stuff. And I totally understand if you don't wanna scan this right now. Um, It's on our website, it'll be on our social media. Uh, I will tell you, scanning that is not a sign of weakness, that is the, that's a posture of strength, right there. Because you'll find here like, 
uh, uh, more sermons about God's vision for sex, teachings on how the dopamine system in your brain works, and education on not only what this does to your heart, but also what it's doing in our world, and how to be an advocate of the Imago Day, and how to protect victims of this, and how with every tap on your phone or click on your computer, we really are voting for whether or whether or not this industry grows or starts to shrink. And 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 the 90-day the 90-day journey just kind of laid out for you. It's very it'll be very very helpful. I want to send you in that direction. And I want to say one more time before we move on to the last thing, only the unreasonable. That I don't know what it is, but there is a grace on this church for this year when it comes to change. If, you're, if you want to change, and specifically if you want freedom from this stuff, it's almost like God saying, if you want it, right now is the time to take it. But you better show up willing to be a little bit unreasonable because only the unreasonable will walk in freedom when it comes to this. And then last but not least, lean into love. Lean into love. Paul describes the love of God like an ocean and says, oh, that you might just come to know. And when he says know, he doesn't mean you know intellectually because you read about it. He means you know experientially because you've, 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 you've dived into that ocean of his love and you've come to know a little bit more how wide and how deep and how far it really is, sinking deep. His love so deep, washing over you. Because all of us, man, are are wounded. That's why if, if pornography isn't your drug of choice, can I just say praise God for that? And please don't throw stones because you got your stuff. And I'm telling you that that whole cycle, you can replace pornography with your phone or social media so easily, so fast. We all, man, need healing. It's like when you were a kid and you cut your knee open and like two weeks later, almost like magic, just a faint scar because everything heals when you give it what it needs to heal. It's just that your soul needs mercy to heal and your heart needs love to heal and your mind needs hope to heal and we all need Jesus to heal and deep cries out to deep. It's that verse a lot of us quote and not a lot of us really know what it means. I'll take a shot at it right here. I think it means the depths of your soul crying out to the depths of God's ocean of love for you. So when you show up to Red Rocks and and we're all gathered in here worshiping and you just, you feel good and you can't explain it and you say like, man, I just, I love the vibes. I love the energy. Can I translate that for you? you what you're really experiencing is your soul's coming home your soul the depths of your soul is sinking deep into the depths of God's ocean of love for you and that is where healing and wholeness is truly found and so my prayer for you as Mackenzie sings this truth over you you're welcome to stand but you're welcome just to stay seated this is you and God and just cry out to him God would you heal me God could I experience your love a little bit more today Let his kindness draw you to repentance. Cry out on behalf of our nation, on behalf of our world. God, would you be with victims? Would you be with the violators? Would you be with prostitutes? Would you be with pimps? I'm telling you, justice is helpful and justice is is holy, but the only solution for a fragmented humanity is for the love of God to pierce every broken human heart. Anything else is throwing a Band-Aid on something that needs surgery. The love of God is here to do surgery. So as we sing this, invite him in to do just that in your life. Wide awake and stirred by grace, sinking deep in an ocean of his love, amen? Holy Spirit, we love you. And right now, I just, um, I imagine going from one ocean to the other. The first ocean, the ocean of, of our culture and of our world that saltwater ocean and we're dying of dehydration, water everywhere, not a drop to drink. Every sip makes you thirstier. But God, then all of a sudden, it's like we're sinking deep in a different ocean, an ocean of living water where every sip actually fulfills and delivers on what it promises. I pray as we sing this truth that the truth we declare would become the reality we experience sinking deep in your love in Jesus name amen